Next, welcome Rick Ridgway, Patagonia's Vice President of Public Engagement. Here with The Atlantic's Matt Thompson. Rick, you have, um, if you would forgive me, you have a relatively boring title. <laughs> and it conceals what is an extraordinarily um, rich series of, uh, of, of accomplishments and work. Let me for, indulge me in this litany for a moment. You were part of the first American team to summit K2, um, one of the highest peaks in the world. You have built and sold companies. You've done product development. You were the founding chairman of the Sustainable Apparel, Apparel Coalition. You created an incredibly successful stock photo and film agency that specializes in nature and adventure imagery. Um, you've written countless books and magazine stories. What is the through line that, what has motivated you from, um, from one point in that litany to the next? What's been the constant? You know, coming up these steps just now <laughs> reminded me of a Gary Larson cartoon where <clears throat> there's a, a guy on the podium going, now ladies and gentlemen, the man who's conquered Everest, K2, Kilimanjaro, and <laughs> off to the side you see this old guy going like this as he's about to pitch over backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, the through line. Um, so, I, I have had this uh, privileged life of being able to go on adventures uh, around the world. Uh, the first big wall climb in Antarctica that you see on the screen here. I suppose the through line, the most important one of all, has been <clears throat> uh, the connection uh, that these adventures have uh, given me to the wild parts of the world, uh, to the natural parts of the world and how that connection has uh, informed uh, who I am, uh, who I am as a, as a parent, uh, who I am as a, as a business person, as a, as a citizen. If there's anything at the end of this little short session we've got today that all of you could, I hope, take away from this, it's the importance of that connection, and not in my life, but in, in, in your lives. Because so many of us have lost that now, uh, and there's so much to be gained from it. We are looking at these images of you um, on the process of climbing K2, of, um, of being the first American team um, to, to go to this place. Um, it's 40 years since that trip. Um, what, what do you find when you go to a place where so few humans have been? Well, you know, back, back when we climbed K2 in 19, uh, it was 1978, as you said, over just now 40 years ago. Uh, and now it's considered of the high altitude mountains in the world, the, the hardest mountain in the world to climb. And it's just a good thing we didn't know that back then. <clears throat> but, but that's actually a serious comment because it represents the limits uh, that all of us can place on ourselves. Uh, you know, if we think uh, in terms of barriers instead of opportunities. So I, I took so many lessons uh, from uh, the high altitude that I brought home to sea level from that climb of K2 and uh, applied to my life all those four decades ago. Obviously, I, I learned what tenacity can do. You know, I learned about, you know, not so much taking risk. People think you're a climber, you're a risk taker, but climbers learn to manage risk. And when you take those lessons and break them back home and, 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 and apply them to your job, uh, you know, that can do uh, extraordinary things. Uh, but again, the most important lessons of all were those connections to nature. <clears throat> uh, you know, of these achievements, you know, this litany of things that I've done, there, there's one that just happened that's really cool. <laughs> I'm going into the Guinness Book of World's Records with my climbing partner who took that photograph of me that you're looking at, <clears throat> because shortly before he took that shot, right there on that day, we were paused on the climb when a cloud of butterflies came by and landed in the snow. We were at 23 and a half thousand feet. And, I, and we took some pictures of them and I put it in the book I wrote about the climb. And just a few months ago, some entomologists were reading that book and they asked us if we had a photograph of the butterfly and we sent it to them. They named the species and we're going into the book of records for the highest recorded uh, sighting of an, of an insect wow. in history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Before we talk about Patagonia the company, I wanted to ask you about Patagonia the place. Mm -hmm. um, you've been there enough um, 
to see it evolve um, from a, a relatively remote and untrammeled place to one that's drawn a lot of tourism. Um, what has been lost or gained in that transition? Well, um, again, our little interview here needs to be about Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia, you know, uh, more than me. And the company's called Patagonia because in 1968, Yvonne went on a climb there with his partner, Doug Tompkins, who founded the North Face, um, to do what then was only the third ascent of Fitzroy, one of the most emblematic peaks in, in Patagonia. Uh, and it took them two months to climb the mountain. They drove an old Ford van from California to Patagonia. That took six months. <clears throat> and the experiences from that climb <clears throat> directly informed how Doug formed the North Face and later the clothing company Esprit and how, Patag and how Yvonne <clears throat> founded Patagonia. And in fact, that's why the company's called Patagonia. That peak on your label or your jacket is Fitzroy. <clears throat> and it was the inspiration uh, from that trip that guided the lives of both of those people. And, <clears throat> and it was going back to this place that we all fell in love with and seeing what, it hap what happened to it over the interim decades since the late 60s, where we've witnessed <clears throat> grasslands uh, actually turn into deserts. We've witnessed forests being clear-cut <clears throat> Uh, of beech trees that will take generations to regrow if they ever do. And I think most astounding in our own lifetimes is witnessing the disappearance of the glaciers that we climbed when we were kids that now are no longer there. <clears throat> and when you witness geologic change in human time, it can be so profound, it is so profound, that you've just, as an individual, got to do something about it. And if you're in business, as Yvonne has done, you use your business as a tool and an agent for environmental protection. And that is ultimately the origin of it, the origin of that commitment. Let's talk about Bears Ears. Mm -hmm. um, a big focus of Patagonia, the company's recent activism, has been around the Bears Ears um, monument, which was significantly expanded under the Obama administration and then contracted again under the Trump administration. Now, Patagonia has taken the Trump administration has, uh, to, uh, to court um, over the reduction in Bears Ears. Um, I'm curious about the approach that you've taken with um, a company like Walmart, um, just as a juxtaposition with, um, with the approach to the Trump administration. Walmart is often thought of as a company that in, in its approach and in its values is almost diametrically opposite to Patagonia's, making new things, lots and lots of them, as opposed to reuse. Um, and yet you've partnered with them. Um, but you've had a very, you've taken a very hard line as a company, and your CEO has taken a very hard line on the Trump administration. Um, uh, Yvon Chouinard has called it uh, evil government. Um, why that divergence in approach? <clears throat> well, let me answer your question by backing up to the first part of it, where you know you yourself said that <clears throat> we took this activist approach. And you know, I've been a groupie there at Patagonia since it started in 1973. It's, uh, one of Yvonne's main climbing partners, you know, hanging out there doing contract work for them going all the way back to the beginning. So I've been there as a witness to <clears throat> watch how he founded the company, as I said a minute ago, to be a tool for environmental activism, uh, for initially supporting activists. Uh, and so I've watched this place now for a little over 45 years, and I can say that it has never been more committed, committed to activism than it is now. Uh, it's, it's now over a billion dollar a year company, and it's getting ornery and ornery every year, which is the opposite of what happens to most companies when they grow. And it is just doing kick-ass activism now. And here's, here, here's another thing. In the 45 years plus we've been in business, we've never been more successful as a business than we are right now. So as a business model, it is really working. And as a business model, we want to hold that up to other companies like Walmart and say, you know what, this works. And Walmart, we've been doing things with them now for 15 years. And <clears throat> they come back like a lot of big companies do and say, well, you guys can be you know, that extreme, that activist, because you 
uh, serve you know, the very tip of the customer pyramid, the segment that's right at the top. And we say, you know, guess what, guys? You better pay attention because that pyramid's turning upside down. You know, and it's no longer this isolated segment of uh, customers that support our business, but it's a very fast uh, increasing base that is your base, and you need to pay attention to that. And you know, our um, the people running Walmart, we've been working with them over uh, through uh, three CEOs now, and they've all been committed to varying degrees to guiding their company towards uh, increasing commitments to uh, sustainability. And, 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 they're, and they're serious about it. But, uh, you know, over those 15 years, little by little, you know, they're, they're getting more and more committed. And, and we um, respect uh, the position we've had uh, as, it, as it has been uh, influencing them in any way we can towards those increasing commitments. And just um, two weeks ago, um, we made the most recent one where we launched a campaign uh, called Time Off to Vote, where we're trying to get other companies uh, to follow our lead, to give their employees the time to go to the polls. <laughs> and <clears throat> Thank you. We've, um, uh, as of two or three days ago, we had 190 companies that have joined us. There were 30 more in the pipeline two days ago. I bet it's north of 200 uh, this morning. But the biggest one uh, joining us is Walmart, and, and, and that is really important, and they deserve an applaud for that. <clears throat> to go back to Bears Ears for a second, if you spoke to, say, Senator Orrin Hatch in Utah, um, he would say that the closing off of this land um, to oil and gas exploration um, is taking away that oil and gas exploration could fund um, public schools and was designated to fund public schools. And I think to some Americans, they hear, um, they hear a, a commitment to conservation, to preserving the environment as an abstract value that takes away from something that's very tangible, money that could go towards educating kids in public schools. And how, how do you answer that? Well, we answer it using the same uh, lexicon and vocabulary that he does, dollars. And we can make a very defensible argument that uh, keeping bears ears protected will add more economic value than cutting it off, reducing it in size, and selling it off to the highest bidder in the extractive industry and mining in in oil and mining industries. And, and, and that is a very defensible argument. Our industry, the outdoor industry, collectively adds to the uh, GNP of the country uh, $870 billion a year. <clears throat> um, we are uh, an enormously influential industry that creates um, tens of thousands of jobs in the areas around the protected areas. And, and the region in Utah, immediately adjacent to Bears Ears, is a very good example of that, where the small towns like Boulder, Utah, are actually enjoying an economic boom because of the expansion of Bears Ears and its neighbor, uh, Escalante National Park. So we can make an argument for that that supports our lawsuit against this current administration to reduce the size of those two monuments. Do you, do you worry at all that um, the boldness of your ad advocacy and of your CEO's rhetoric to call the Trump administration an evil government, for example, do you worry that that contributes to a political divergence that's harmful? We do, and we should all be worried about that. But we cannot turn our back on the uh, opportunity to reverse this uh, destruction of our uh, environment, uh, too concerned about bringing uh, the two sides back together. And if we could do anything to implore civil society of our country uh, to bring themselves back together, it would be to get out into those places, to get out into nature, to learn from nature. That's where we came from as human beings, and that's where we have to go back to, and that's what will bring us together. Rick Ridgway, mm -hmm. VP of Public Engagement at Patagonia, thank you thank so you. much for joining us this morning. Thanks, Matt.